How many of you have ever in your life owned a goldfish? Hands? Bleachers? Hands? How many of you had a goldfish that died? Why are there more this time? Listen, I feel better. Our goldfish usually only lasted about three days. Our kids would bring them home from the fair or the carnival. Did you ever do this in that, you know, kind of puffy little plastic bag filled with water? We'd put them in this little bowl, and they'd stay in that bowl for about three days. They'd die, and they'd end up in the other bowl. And it just, I mean, it just, I thought, it's a lousy life being a goldfish. I mean, we did have one that lived a little while. We kept him in a bowl by the back door. We fed him. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But the, the goofy thing is this. It is no, f I mean, to ha think about life as a goldfish. Think about this. If you are a goldfish, you live, you're this big. You live in this little bowl. You just get your speed up. And you run into a wall. You hang a left. Run into another wall. This is your whole life. This is a life. It's no wonder they die young. Why would you stay alive if all you do is live in this little goldfish bowl? Well, listen, I found out there's a whole new story about goldfish because I was uh, out at this mission in California, and I'm looking in this pond, and, and the guy says there, uh, I see this fish that's, oh, it's about a foot long, and it's gold. And I said, what do you call that fish? He said, sir, that is a goldfish. I'm going, duh. What do you mean? That is not a goldfish. A goldfish is this long, not this long. It swims in a little bowl. What is this, like goldfish jaws? Da -da -da -da. Not possible. Well, my wife, who grew up on a farm, I grew up in the city, so I'm a dummy, but my wife took me over and she said, hey, honey, don't embarrass yourself anymore. This is really what happens to goldfish. I said, get out of it. No, she said, when you take goldfish out of a little bowl and you put them in a big pond, they start to grow. And they could be a foot long, they could be two feet long. I'm going, no. Nah. We got back to New York where I live. We called the New York Aquarium. I still did not believe. We called the New York Aquarium. I asked for their head goldfishologist. They hung up. We called back. I said, tell me about goldfish. The guy said, it's true. What happens is that when you put a goldfish in a little bowl, it starts to produce this enzyme that keeps it from growing so it won't get too big for the bowl. And, and but when you take it out of that bowl and you put it in a big pond, it starts to grow and grow and grow and become everything it was supposed to be because you got it out of the little goldfish bowl and you got it in the big pond. Well, the next time I saw my little guy by the back door, I'm going by and I want to say to him, man, if you only knew, <laughs> if you only knew what you could be, if you could ever get out of that goldfish bowl and get into the big pond. That's exactly what your creator, the creator of all this, wants to say to you wherever you are right now around this ball field. He says, man, if you could ever get out of the little goldfish bowl life you're living, aren't you tired of running into the edge of it? Aren't you tired of a life too small? Your creator says, I have got a big pond I designed for you to live in, and this ain't it. There's something bigger than this. In fact, I really believe that there are some people here who have done enough thinking about life. You're smart enough to say, man, there's got to be more than what I've been doing. There's got to be more than romances and parties and TV and a bottle and a basketball and a baby. There's got to be more than this. Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain at the top of his career. Uh, pretty much the inventor of grunge music with Nirvana. Turn on MTV, you couldn't watch an hour without Kurt Cobain being on there. And Kurt Cobain tried to find a big enough bowl to live in. And he got to the very top, the biggest, he got to the edge of his goldfish bowl. And here he was at the top, and when he died and killed himself a couple of months ago, I asked a teenage friend of mine, I said, what do you think about Kurt Cobain, Co Cobain's suicide? He said, man, it stinks. He said, the guy was at the top of his career. Everybody was talking about his music. He's got all this money, all this fame, and he kills himself. Kurt Cobain, music wouldn't do it for him. He thought music was somehow going to be enough. Then he got married. He had a little baby girl. Still not enough. Kurt Cobain looks around and says, music, top of the career, money, fame, doesn't kill the pain in my heart. 
He said, man, there's got to be something bigger, and he couldn't find it, and he ended his life. I believe there's some people here, there's guys out there who, and, and girls out here who with the, behind your mask, when you, when you can take your mask off that you wear all the time, you know that this isn't the way we're supposed to be living. You look around and you say, man, I'm tired of us hurting each other. Is it cool to hurt each other like we do all the time? Is that really cool? I don't think so. We're hurt. You say, aren't you, aren't you tired of people hurting each other, hurting themselves, killing themselves, hurting inside and the pain never goes away? Aren't you tired of lonely nights? Aren't you tired of people dying too young? There's got to be something bigger. There's got to be something better. And if there's a young man or young woman anywhere within the sound of my voice who's smart enough to know that this isn't all they're supposed to be, who's tired of living like this, who's tired of a small life, you are ready for the big pond, baby. And I want to tell you where it is. There is somebody who tonight before this night is over, is going to leave the goldfish bowl that most people live in and is going to take the lid off their life and you're going to be in the big pond you were made for. It doesn't have to be like everybody else is doing it around you. They're, the most famous photograph of the century, or the, they call it the photo of the century, was taken by a satellite that the U.S. put in outer space. It went to the far edge of our solar system and it took a photo of all the nine planets in our solar system and, and uh, everything we've got here. This photo was talked about by Carl Sagan, who's probably the most famous, uh, uh, one of the most famous scientists in the world. Listen to what he said. He said, when you look at this photo of our solar system, that you, when you see the planets, you see these little blue dots around this one bright spot that just went down over there called the sun. And he said, that that little blue dot, like this little speck, you got to look real hard to see it in this picture, this little blue dot called Earth, he said that's where everybody you've ever known, everybody you've ever heard of, everybody who ever lived has lived on that little blue dot. That little blue dot, that whole picture is one solar system out of a hundred billion galaxies that have been discovered. Folks, listen to me. If you want life like it was meant to be, if you want life that's worth sticking around for, if you want life that's got some love and some power to it, let me tell you where the big pond is. It is for you to have a personal relationship with the creator of all that, with the creator of a hundred billion galaxies. Guys, he doesn't have to be out there. He can be in here with you all the time tackling your problems. How would you like to tackle your problems with the creator of the universe on your side? How would you like to handle your pain with the creator of the universe helping you carry your pain? How would you like to deal with your loneliness with having that kind of love and that kind of power available to you? Folks, that's the big pond we were made for. A personal relationship with the creator of the universe. And there is someone here who you came to this ball field, you may not even be here, you may be out around somewhere just hearing the sound of this, but the fact is that you tonight came here or are here without a relationship with your Creator. Listen to me, within the next very few minutes, someone here who came without their Creator will leave here with Him. It could be you. Someone here will leave with a personal love relationship with the awesome creator of the universe to complete the incomplete circle of your life. But, but how do you do that? How do you get a relationship with the creator? We were made for that relationship. It says in the Bible in Colossians 1.16, all things were made by Jesus and for Jesus. Wait, did you know that means you? Put your name in there. Right here. Put your name in here. Was made by Jesus and for Jesus. Everybody around here tonight, you were made by Jesus. You were made for Jesus. You're going to have a hole in your heart until you have Jesus. And that same creator says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for evil. To give you a future. Would you like one? And to give you a hope. Would you like some? Then you need a relationship personally with your creator. How do you get one? Because many of us here don't have one yet. We're not born with one. 
unless you go the one way there is to get to the Creator, you don't have a relationship with Him. Listen, please, would you, to words out of the only book the Creator ever wrote. Now, if you can't listen much, you say, I have very limited listening ability. All right. Would you listen to words out of the Creator's book? Please listen to this. I want you to meet one of the followers of the Son of God named Thomas. If you've ever heard of him, you know there's a word that goes with his name. For 2,000 years, he's been called Doubting Thomas. He was one of the followers of Jesus who was around him for three years and never yet had believed in him until Jesus Christ blew the doors off his grave and did what no man had ever done and came back to life after he died. Now, I want you to read what happens. Jesus has come back and appeared to his followers. Thomas was not there. Now, this is the most important thing. I ask you wherever you are to be silent for the reading of the Creator's words. I'm about to answer for you how you could leave here with a personal relationship with the Creator of the universe. Thomas, one of the twelve disciples, was not with the disciples when Jesus came the first time. The other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. If you are not sure that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, hello, Thomas. You're right there with him. Listen to what it says. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Touch my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side where the spear wound was in the cross. Then stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord, Did you notice what it said about Thomas? It said that Jesus came and stood among them. Hear me on this. Jesus comes right where you are, even if you don't believe in Him, so you can have a relationship with your Creator. Guys, listen. Someone here tonight? Jesus is coming where you are on this ball field. I'm not important, but who I work for is. Jesus is here. And Jesus stands right among us. And I'm looking out at several hundred people, but I want you to know whether you're back by the concession stand, you guys are right up front, you're in the bleachers, or I can't see you, you're somewhere around the edges. Right now, Jesus sees only you. And Jesus has come close to you, so you could do what Thomas did. Reach out and touch him. But listen, would you get another chance? I don't know. All I know is this. You have only one guaranteed chance to meet Jesus Christ. Here. Now. This is the only one you can count on. There's not one person here that is guaranteed a tomorrow. I've already heard about too many kids from around here who died very young. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. Jesus comes and stands among us. And could I beg you to do this? Would you, for just a few minutes in your life, think seriously about the Creator's Son? Would you, for just a few minutes, think seriously about Jesus Christ for one time in your life? Forget your friends. Forget what's going to happen in a few minutes. Think seriously about the Creator's Son. You see what happened to Thomas? First of all, I would ask you to do what happened to Thomas. I would ask you to look at the wounds of Jesus. If Jesus was walking around here tonight, 
you'd still see the wounds. You'd see a nail mark in his hand. You'd see a nail mark in his hand. You'd see nail marks in his feet. You'd see a deep gash in his side. And probably the marks of crown of thorns was jammed down on his forehead. When Thomas saw what Jesus had gone through for him, Thomas could no longer turn his back on Jesus. I would just ask you tonight, once in your life, look at the wounds of Jesus Christ. You say, why? Because they were for you. They were for you. See, I... I there's a guy I heard of, maybe you've heard of him too. His name was Sergei Krikalev. Who in the world is that? He was a Russian Soviet Union cosmonaut back when there was a Soviet Union, before it all fell apart a couple of years ago. And he was launched on a mission. He was supposed to be gone for five months circling planet Earth on behalf of the Soviet Union. Okay, that's good. He leaves in May. He's supposed to be back in October. He kisses his wife and baby daughter goodbye. Says, see you in October. Oh, yeah? Here's what happened. By October, there had been a revolution in the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had busted apart. There was no Soviet... There was when he left. They launched him. Now he's up in this orbit, and the Soviet Union is broken apart, and they don't know who's in charge of the space program anymore. Oh, this is nice. So Sergei Krikalev... This is a true story. This is in the news. Sergey's up there, and he's going, Hello down there, it's October, me coming home. And they're going, We don't know who's in charge anymore. Comrade, sorry. I want to come home. Too bad. So here is Sergey. He's supposed to, he's been up there five months. Going around in his orbit. It's now November, it's December, it's January. Mm, hello! It's February. This is a true story. It's March. He's been up there ten months. His wife's going, when he gets home, I want to kill him. It's not his fault, but he is trapped in this orbit, going nowhere, and he can't get back. Finally, they launched a rescue mission and brought him back. Guys, that's a picture of what the Creator says our life is like. We have gotten in an orbit away from our Creator. We're supposed to be. He gave us our life. We're supposed to be revolving our life around Him. A lot of people here tonight, you're over here in an orbit away from God. Can't you feel it? You're away from Him. You're not close to Him. You don't know Him. It's like there's a wall between you and Him. And here I am, trapped in an orbit, going nowhere. If I die like this, it's hell. Now, how do I get back? Well, for Sergei Krikalev, it took a rescue mission. Somebody had to launch a rescue mission. Listen to me. God, your Creator, who you and I have sinned against, we said, God, I'll do what I want to do with my body. I don't care what you say. God, I'll do what I want to do with my mouth. I don't care what you say. God, I'm going to hurt the people I love with this mouth sometimes. I don't care what you say. I'm going to have my way. We're shaking our little fist at our Creator who runs all that. And there's a death penalty for that. We're away from Him. But listen to this. Listen to God's words from the Creator's book. In 1 John 4, 9 and 10, it says this. This is how we know God loves us. He sent His one and only Son to live among us so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God. Don't give me that. We didn't. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent His only Son to be the sacrifice for our sins. I did the sinning. God's Son did the dying. Listen to me. Whatever you do, don't ignore don't turn your back on the death of the Creator's Son. You'll have to explain that to God someday. How you could not care that His one and only Son would love you enough to take your death penalty. How are you going to explain that to God? You can't. He is our only hope. And Thomas said, look at the wounds. When I see the price He paid, when I realize the death He died, Jesus, I'm yours. Tonight I ask you to look at the cross of Jesus Christ where He's dying for you and tell me how you can say no to that love. 
And if you do, how you'll ever explain it to the Heavenly Father. And then look at his power. Jesus Christ comes back alive. I saw a little cartoon from B.C. Did you ever see the cartoon B.C.? The little uh, prehistoric guy running around in his caveman outfit? Well, on Easter morning, a year ago, I loved it. It was a really unique cartoon. Here is B.C., the little caveman, standing outside an empty tomb. And there's a stone rolled away from it. And there's only one word out of four panels. There's only one word. First word, first panel, he's just standing outside looking in. Second panel, he's sticking his head in. He's looking more. Third panel, he's walking around inside this tomb, and he sees that the man who was buried there is gone. And in the last panel, he's standing out in front. He knows Jesus is alive, and he says one word in big, bold letters. Yes! Oh, well, man, that's how I feel. Listen, there's no rock star who ever came back from the dead. There is no president. There's no chief. There's no prime minister. There's no rich and powerful person. But I ask you to consider putting your life in the hands of the only man who's got the power to conquer what's conquered every man who ever lived except one. Jesus Christ is alive tonight. Yes. Yes, he is. Now, do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? You will see him someday. And there's somebody in the sound of my voice tonight. And you say, well, I'm not sure I want to, I'm not sure I want to follow Jesus Christ. You can ignore him tonight. But there is a time coming when you will not be able to ignore Jesus. For you will be standing face to face before him. If he was dead, you wouldn't meet him. But because he's alive, he will be your judge one day. The Bible says that it is appointed to man once to die. We have an appointment with God. I don't know when mine is. You don't know when yours is. Somewhere in America tonight is a teenager who thinks they'll be alive tomorrow and they won't be. You say, it won't be me. Well, that's what they're all saying. There's an appointment we all keep with God. And when we do, we will be face to face with Jesus. You can't postpone that appointment. You can't cancel it. And if you ignore him tonight, you're in trouble that night. You will not be able to ignore Jesus then. I've met some people here who are so afraid of their friends, so afraid of their friends, they're afraid to say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Should you be afraid of your friends or should you be afraid of your Creator if you reject His Son? The Bible says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I've come all the way from New York because I pray that no one here will ever stand before Jesus Christ and He says to you, I'm sorry, you, I came to you, I appeared to you, I came close to you. I came to that ball field in Plummer, Idaho. I sent a band from Nashville, some guy from New York. I sent people who told you that Christ had changed their life and you said, no, thank you. Don't make that mistake. Prepare for your appointment with Jesus Christ. You don't know when it will be. You will no longer be able to run from Him. Go ahead, run from Him tonight. But the moment comes when you can run no more. Jesus in you tonight. Jesus in you that night. What you do with Him tonight will determine what He will do with you on the day you keep your appointment with Him. Tonight, Jesus Christ comes along and He says to you what He said to Thomas in that room. Reach out and touch me. He said to Thomas, reach out your hand while I'm here and believe. Do you know what the word believe means in the Bible? It's what I did the day I was drowning. I was too proud to tell my friends I was drowning in Lake Michigan. I was too proud to tell them I couldn't swim. Not too proud to tell I was drowning. Couldn't tell them anything when I was drowning. I did, they didn't know I couldn't swim. So I'm literally, I went out too far, I'm drinking the lake. Not a good idea. They, oh listen, do my friends help me? Oh no. They said, oh Ron, he's such a clown, he is goofing off. No, I was dying. And there was nobody helping me. I went down a first time, I went down a second time. And guys, I can remember it like it was tonight. I can see that water coming over me, I can feel the panic. It was a horrendous feeling. I thought it was over. Finally, a hand reached out to me. And I knew what to do. I didn't just stick my head above the water and say, Hi, thanks for coming. I didn't just stick my head above the water and say, I think you could probably save me. Oh, no. No, 
Uh, when that guy reached out his hand, I grabbed it. I grabbed him and said, man, you are my only hope in my heart. I knew I was dying without him. When did you ever do that with Jesus Christ? Maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you've been confirmed. Maybe you've gone to different Christian stuff. Maybe you've never heard this before. But has there ever been a moment when you have said, Jesus, I believe in you like a drowning man grabs a lifeguard. You're my only hope. Jesus, if I'm ever going to know the Creator, if I'm ever going to have my sins forgiven, if I'm ever going to go to heaven, you're my only hope. Jesus, I'm standing at your cross and I'm taking you for me. You, I see your wounds. I see how much you love me. I see that you're alive. I know I'm going to stand before you someday. And I want your love. I want your power. Jesus, my Lord and my God. That's what Thomas said. Somebody here, I want to give you that opportunity in just a moment. I said that you may have come here without a relationship with your Creator. You could leave here with one. Why would you turn your back on Him? Imagine that you're on a beach. Imagine that there's a circle in the sand. Imagine that there's only two people that can fit into that circle. It's a little circle. And in that circle is Jesus Christ, whatever you think He looks like, and you. Your friends are not there. And they won't be when you meet Jesus. Your family's not there. I'm not there. You and Jesus. Jesus holds out a hand to you. You see the nail mark? It's there because of the price He paid for you because He loves you. And he reaches out a hand to you and he says, I love you very much. I made you. I paid for you with my life. Now would you give your life to me? You have two choices. You can grab his hand and you can say, Jesus, I'm yours. No one ever loved me this much. I want all the love and all the power you've got. I'm yours or you turn your back and you walk away and you leave God's son standing there with his hand reaching out to you. That's what's going on wherever you are around this ball field tonight. The hand of Jesus on August 16, 1994 is reaching out to you. Will you grab it? Or will you walk away? It will be recorded forever what you do with Jesus tonight. Don't turn your back on the death of the Son of God for you. There's a little boy on a reservation who was in one of those reservations where there's a lot of sheep. Because his daddy had died, he had to take care of the sheep. He was a pretty young boy. And... Uh, he lived just with his mom in a, this little hut. And one day a, a pastor came along and, and talked to the little boy. And he said, little boy, do you, do you know anything about Jesus? And, and the little boy said, no, I don't know anything about him. And, and so the pastor told him about how much Jesus had loved him to, to die for his sin. And, and, and the little boy was interested in knowing Jesus. And, and just before the pastor left, he said, listen, do you know any stuff in the Bible? And he said, no. And he said, well, could I teach you something in the Bible? And the little boy said, I, I don't think I could remember. And he said, well, I think you could. You, you know, you've got the five fingers here on your, on your left hand. He said, do this. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. The little boy said, well, I could do the Lord is my shepherd. And, and the pastor said, but when you get to the fourth finger, take your right hand and do this. The Lord is my shepherd. The little boy said, okay. It was a year later, and this pastor came back by, and he wanted to see the little boy and the mother again. So he knocked at the door of this hut, and Mom came to the door, and, and he said, uh, is your son here? And she said, you didn't hear? She said, there was a sudden blizzard that came up last winter when he was way out in the back where the sheep were, and he didn't come home. She said it took two days to find his body. She said when the search party found him, he was course frozen to death she said but sir um, when they found his body there was something very very unusual about the way he died because he died with his right hand wrapped around the fourth finger of his left hand the Lord is my shepherd is he yours my Lord, my God, my Savior, my Shepherd. You came here with 
without him. You can leave here with him. I'd like to ask everybody all around here if you'd close your eyes for just a minute. I'd like to pray in a moment and talk to the creator. But for this moment, I wonder, would you forget your friends for a minute? Sometimes you forgot God for your friends. Why don't you forget your friends for God for a minute? Tonight, you're in that circle with Jesus on that beach. In that circle. He reaches out his hand. He says, reach out your hand and believe like he did at Thomas. You going to leave him there? Or are you going to grab the hand of the one who loves you most? And say, Lord, I'm tired of running my life. I'm tired of the goldfish bowl life. I want to know my creator. And I know you're the only one who can bring me to him because you died to take care of the wall between me and him. Do you want him? You ready to grab his hand? I'm going to pray a prayer in a minute. If you have never pledged your allegiance to Jesus Christ, if you've never grabbed him like that drowning person grabbed a lifeguard and said, Jesus, you're my only hope, would you make this prayer your own? I'm going to pray it out loud. I ask you to pray it quietly. In your heart, Jesus is here. He'll be listening. Here's the prayer. Lord, I've been running my life. I quit. I was made by you. I was made for you. I've been living for me. I want that to change. I don't want to turn my back on your love. And Jesus, I believe that some of those sins that you're dying for on that cross are mine. The lies I've told, the people I've hurt, the memories I wish I could erase, the laws of God I've broken. But I believe, Lord, that you're taking my death penalty because you love me. And if you could die for me, I could live for you. And so, Lord, tonight I'm pinning all my hopes on you. I'm putting all my trust in you to take down the wall between me and God and to get me to heaven. You're my only hope. So I'm yours.